Hello and welcome to our discussion of the conquest, the Seven Years' War. Conquest, uh, how, we, how we normally refer to the defeat of the French Empire. And that's what the Seven Years' War is all about. It's this massive global war between, well, not just Britain and France, but they're certainly the two principles in the war. And in, in this course and in North American history in general, we look at the North American theater of that war. And the significance is, is enormous. It means that um, means that the French are defeated in North America, and they, they won't play a, a well, they'll play a small role, but a very very minor role in North American uh, imperial colonial uh, politics into the future. So the, the, it's the defeat of the French Empire, uh, simply said. Probably in terms of a simple event or a single event. Probably the most important event we'll do in this course. Uh, certainly has the most far-reaching consequences. Um, it's the defeat of the French Empire. All the territory that we now call Canada was, until this point in time, claimed, I'll stress the word claimed, as we've seen, Indigenous hold on that territory was still pretty clear, but French claims on that territory were were not challenged by the British, and that's the important difference between between the indigenous claims and the British claims. The British would certainly have liked to have challenged those claims. The main reason, and this is why it's another one of the reasons why it's so decisive um, in the history of Canada, is that the indigenous peoples and the French had pretty good relations, largely through trade. Now, uh, we could we can we can oversimplify how smooth those were, but certainly compared to the British, uh, where the relationships were more or less continuous warfare, uh, the relationships that the British, uh, sorry, that the French had with indigenous people, primarily through the fur trade, were largely positive. All kinds of problems, but by and large positive. And that meant that oftentimes in times of war, not always, but oftentimes in times of war, uh, the indigenous peoples, particularly in the interior, but in Nova Scotia as well, in New England, we saw the Wabanaki Confederacy last week, um, certainly they would come um, and join alliances uh, with the French against the British. So that, that again, that will mark a, a change in in uh, in the pol political relationships that will exist between Indigenous people and European colonizers once the French are gone. This painting uh, by Benjamin West shows the death of Wolfe, uh, and for many English Canadians in particular, this painting grabs that moment, symbolizes that moment when British Canada began. Here's the supreme sacrifice, a martyr being created here, uh, a martyr to Protestant British imperial advancement. Um, he's dying in this moment. You can see it's a kind of Christ-like death, dying almost like in the arms of the disciples. Um, and there's that kind of sense here that something greater uh, is going on here. And you can see the battle raging in the background. Uh, and he does die just as it seems clear that the French are going to surrender. And so he dies, at least in this painting's version of things, uh, content that he's done his, his duty for the empire. We're going to look at the Seven Years' War fairly quickly in this video. I've just got a few minutes to spend on it. And then we're going to look at the outcomes and then something of the symbolic significance of the war. So a fairly simple outline of where we're going to, where we're going to go in the next few minutes. Recall from last week in our discussion of the Acadians that after 1710, a large chunk of Nova Scotia, the mainland part of Nova Scotia, not Cape Breton, not modern day Prince Edward Island, um, were passed to the British. And so the French now have limited control um, over that territory. And that territory is very, very important uh, because it guards the entranceway to the Gulf of St. Lawrence. And the Gulf of St. Lawrence, of course, leads to the St. Lawrence River. The St. Lawrence River leads to the Great Lakes. The Great Lakes lead into the interior. If you want to control the interior, you need to be able to get troops in there. You need to be able to get supplies in there. You need to be able to get ships down that river. Lewisburg, that they built here in that time period, uh, is designed to protect that French hold. Major fortification. Uh, spend a ton of money on this. Uh, it turns into a substantial town, a substantial trading port. port. Uh, this week, in, your, in your, some of your one of your readings this week, uh, you'll look at um, the slave trade as it existed in Lewisburg. And again, we don't have this kind of sense of, of slavery being an important part of this part of Canadian history. Um, and it certainly pales in size compared to 
in the Caribbean and even in the southern United States at this point. Um, but it, there is a slave trade there, and it's certainly a substantial one, and you'll see something of, of a discussion of that in our, in our readings this week. They put a lot of money into this. They really hoped this fortress would guard their assets in the interior of North America. The Halifax counter, sorry, the Halifax, the British, the British countered by building Halifax. And you can see it here on this map with the H. Um, and that's just meant to, to counter Lewisburg. The Lewisburg will have troops. Uh, it will have French, French naval vessels there. Uh, the British will put troops in Halifax. So we'll put uh, the Royal Navy, we'll put Royal Navy vessels there. Um, and so it's a way to, to, to counteract you too. Imagine, for example, if the French wanted to attack, well, they probably wouldn't attack Boston, it's a big city, but if they wanted to attack um, outports, settlements, villages around Boston or something like that, Lewisburg would allow that, op that opportunity. Halifax would check that. Halifax could counter that. Uh, same thing again, uh, there, there are several small battles over the course of the 18th century fought along the, the coast of Nova Scotia between French and British and New England fishing people. Um, and so they're imagining that their navies can, can contain that and give their people uh, an advantage in that situation. But what's most important for us to see is the, both the, 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 geolo the geography on the ground, but also that people are preparing for war. People know uh, a significant North American war is coming. Um, it doesn't take a genius to figure this out. The, 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 the wars between Britain and France have been going on for hundreds of years. The religious wars or political wars, um, it will certainly uh, get fought out, <coughs> excuse me, again on the North American continent. Halifax, much smaller, much simpler than Lewisburg. That's, you can see it's just a wooden stockade with some buildings in the center. About 3,000 people brought in, most of them soldiers. Uh, it's really designed to be a kind of pop-up uh, uh, port. Uh, they want to be able to bring in Royal Navy vessels, repair them, fix them, supply them. It's a supply point for, for, for uh, a military position uh, to check the French. It will grow over the next few decades into a, into a proper city, but certainly in the be at the beginning phase is very, very simple. I love that this is a detail. It has nothing to do with our lecture today, but I love the detail. Um, the people that were brought in to build these cities, um, often not the finest people, um, and oftentimes, of course, there's dis issues with discipline in the, in the Navy and amongst the, amongst the Army as well. Right on the waterfront in this map, you see the gallows and the stocks clearly indicated, uh, an indication of, of some of the issues that must have existed uh, in Halifax in that period. It's also worthwhile, we talked about this the other day, but it's also worthwhile talking about it here just for a minute today, uh, the Acadian resistance. The uh, expulsion takes place in 1755, but not everybody's expelled. Some people escape the expulsion, and some people, my own ancestors, uh, in fact, uh, some of them escaped the, the expulsion. Um, but some of them engaged in a guerrilla warfare for the three years following the beginnings of the expulsion, so up to about 1758. It's worth noting that uh, while the expulsion is just before the, the Seven Years' War begins, uh, the latter period means that that resistance is actually forming part of the Seven Years' War. Uh, fairly small scale, uh, not a major theater of the Seven Years' War, uh, but an, again an ongoing attempt on the part of the Mi'kmaq and the Acadians to, to, keep, the, to keep the British off guard, uh, to, to force them to, to send troops where they may not want to send troops, uh, and to show that there's resistance on the ground, that their rule is not as secure as they might think. This is a village, uh, an Acadian uh, Mi'kmaq missionary uh, village on the Miramichi River in what's today New Brunswick. Uh, being attacked by uh, a British unit, and they'll they'll destroy this small settlement, burn the church, uh, and again it's their efforts to say no, this is this is now British territory. The Seven Years' War is a huge war all over the globe, and we tend to talk about it in terms of being um, British and French for, for obvious reasons, um, but it's also important to note that the colonists play a major role in this. Canadian militiamen from, from New France will play an active part in the war, an important part of the war, uh, along the, in the interior of the continent, uh, along the border between New England and New York and, and New France. Um, and uh, American colonists will do the same thing, and some of them will, be, will play important roles. Thousands of, 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 uh, of American colonists uh, will participate in the war. Some of them will be quite famous, like this guy. You may recognize this guy. Anybody recognize this guy? He's very famous. This is George Washington. George Washington as a young man, a colonel, uh, but a colonel in the British Army, well, in the Kentucky militia, but fighting on, on behalf of the, 
of the British uh, of the British in the Seven Years' War, and uh, it's just important to see that this that that two things here: one, that there's a substantial American military capacity being developed here during the war, uh, but two, that they don't think of themselves as Americans yet; they think of themselves still as Britons, and here they are fighting uh, on the side of Britain. The first few years of the war, much of the war takes place in the interior. And here the French do really well. But of course, it's kind of misleading to say the French. What it really means is that French soldiers, powerfully supported by um, indigenous allies and Canadian militiamen, um, fight very successfully in these unconventional uh, locations in the interior. These are not kind of open, classic European battlefield kinds of battles. Uh, these are forest battles, these are ambushes, these are small-scale attacks often as, as troops move from one location to another location and that sort of thing. Uh, here the French do very, very well. Uh, they do well because their own troops and the Canadian militiamen learn indigenous tactics and these tactics are far superior tactics for this kind of terrain, for this kind of warfare. Uh, and they learn effectively. The New Englanders learn less effectively. The British learn not at all. They tend to go in still with their kind of classic techniques. That that will change over the course of the war. Uh, but they 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 don't they, they don't like following indigenous strategies. But certainly the Canadian militiamen and ultimately the New England militiamen as well see that this is a, a, a far superior strategy uh, in this kind of situation. So here the French are doing really quite well. That changes along the coast when the British take the full force of the Royal Navy and some uh, New England and American soldiers uh, to the fore. In the summer of 1758, they attack Lewisburg uh, and lay siege to it for three months, eventually capturing it. Uh, this place was not supposed to be easily captured. They do capture it fairly easily. Fairly easily. That's easy for me to say as I sit at my desk. Um, but it, it wasn't the impregnable uh, fortress that it was certainly planned to be. It was thought to be that this would be a very difficult position to capture. Uh, and in a single summer with some sieging and some, some, some clever land-based uh, assaults from the rear of the fortress, uh, they, they captured Lewisburg really quite effectively. Which means that the Gulf of St. Lawrence is open. Which means they can sail down the St. Lawrence River to Quebec. And that's what they do the next summer. Now, Quickly important to note here uh, that the river plays a big part in the story. Not only does it provide uh, kind of the basic channel of communications and so on, but this is Canada. This river will freeze. Uh, so it means that they have only a few months to get this conquest in. And Quebec is much better defended than Lewisburg. It's up on that, if you've been to Quebec City, many of you have been to Quebec City, I'm sure. It's up on that, uh, that cliff face uh, overlooking the river. Very difficult place to attack. Um, and a very easy place to, not easy place to defend, but it, but it gives you a defensive advantage uh, for sure. You can see what the British do. They set up all kinds of siege equipment, cannons on the other side of the river. They sail ships past, although they lose a lot of those ships, but they sail ships past, firing cannons uh, into the city and effectively laying siege to the city. And over the course of the summer, they do tremendous amounts of damage, but they don't get to actually assault the city. They can't get troops onto the ground around the city to actually Assault, uh, to actually attack the city. Late in September, in what probably would have been the last possible days before they have to start thinking about packing up to get out before the river freezes, um, they do land some troops west of the city uh, and march them up along the plains of, uh, to the west of the city where they engage the French in an open battle on the plains of Abraham. And that's where the, the French are defeated. And this really marks that moment, that moment of, of the, that, the, that the Benjamin West painting gets at, that moment when the French Empire loses its last important uh, position uh, in North America. The war doesn't end in this minute, it will continue the next year. In fact, the French will recapture Quebec the following spring, but the French aren't, uh, the French, the, the Imperial French are unable to get ships and supplies in to, in to support them. Uh, and the French uh, uh, military leaders are effectively required to just pass it back to the, to the British. They, 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 they haven't got the supplies to, to control their own capture. So it, effectively, it's over here in, in 1759. The war goes on for another two years globally, but it's over here in North America, and the French have been defeated. Both generals die in the battle. We've already seen Wolfe 
dying in Benjamin West's famous painting. When Colm dies as well, the two heroic leaders of, of the battle both dying as, as I've suggested already, martyrs for their, for their countries. The destruction uh, in the city is enormous. Uh, three months of siege with heavy equipment bombarding the city. If you ever read a siege diary or anything like that, it's a horrible, horrible thing to read. Uh, the suffering of the people in those conditions, the fear, just living with bombs raining down on you continuously. Uh, and th these couple of uh, contemporary drawings show you just how destructive uh, the siege was. This is from the lower town, down near the water, not up on the cliff. But again, there's, you know, there's nothing habitable left there. Uh, they'll repair some of the stuff, but certainly nothing. But everybody would have had to have fled into the cent central part of the city. And even there, there's massive amounts of damage. Outcomes of all of this. Okay, so two things we can point to here. First, the Royal Proclamation. Second, the Quebec Act. So let's look at the, the Royal Proclamation first. So 1763, the war uh, is, uh, war is um, officially ends with the Treaty of Paris, signed in Paris in 1763. In that year, the British also passed legislation to, uh, to organize the government of its new territories in North America. And there's all kinds of technical features to that that we can pass over uh, for our purposes right now. One important feature of it that we should talk about, though, uh, because it still has bearing today, it still has legal standing today, uh, is the statement that all of the lands beyond the Appalachian Mountains and all of the um, recently captured territories from the French, that those are, that they acknowledge indigenous sovereignty uh, in that territory and it requires a, a treaty process to be to be undertaken by anybody who wants to assume control of any of that territory in other words it establishes a legal framework which must occur if that land is to be transferred into uh, into British hands now it's it's getting way ahead of what we can do in this course but large chunks of North America were not ceded over by treaty. Um, large parts of Quebec, large parts of the Maritimes, large parts of Canada in general were not ceded over uh, by any kind of treaty. We're not, the peoples were not ever conquered in any war. Um, so it's, it's, so it, in those terms, given what the British government said in 1763 and laying out a legal framework for all of this, much of that land is debatable, but it's still clearly possible to argue that that's still indigenous land uh, and that it needs to be treated as such. Uh, and so many, all uh, indigenous land claims somehow tie themselves into the positions outlined in the Royal Proclamation of 1763. So that's the first uh, important outcome of the Seventy Years' War. Um, it affects uh, indigenous people right into the 21st century. It also set, okay, so I, I guess I should say, why did they do this? So they did this because uh, they were, they had two motivations. One was to reward their indigenous allies to show that they would be treated fairly now that the French were gone. <clears throat> and they also wanted to send that message to the former French allies as well. They wanted to show that they could trust their, their new uh, colonial figures on the ground. But they also wanted to send a message to the colonies. So look at the look at these two maps. The map on the left shows that mark down the Appalachian Mountains, very very clear Indian territory to the west. The map on the right is an American map, American produced map. Um, look at the lines. The lines go all the way to the Mississippi River. They're not acknowledging this in way, any way, shape, or form, which also points to how the Royal Proclamation was used by the British to send a message to the American colonists. You're getting a little independent. You're getting a little too independent. Um, we're going to reassert our control. We're going to tell you, you do not actually own that territory to the West. Uh, indigenous people do, and we provide the legal keys to getting that. And the Americans are really kind of ignoring that. Now, 1763, we're less than 15 years away from the American Revolution. This is one of those moments when the colonists of the American colonies are now looking at their British masters and saying, 
you're just imposing rules on us. We don't get to govern our own society. We fought in this war. We fought against, against those French Canadians. We fought against those indigenous people. We supplied money. We supplied men. We supplied arms. We did all of these things, and then you just take the land away from us, and you give some of it back to these French Catholics. Uh, this is the beginnings of irritants, significant irritants, irritants between the American colonists and the British government. The other thing relates to the French Canadians themselves. So the war is over. What are you going to do with the, with the Canadians? What are you going to do with the people? So we saw this with the Acadians. The, there the solution is to expel them. We saw that that wasn't a good solution. Uh, massive deaths. The, the British are viewed as barbaric for having done this. The, the, you know, the world attention sees this action, sees how cruel it is. Um, they're also looking at Quebec and saying, well, it's significantly larger. There was 12,000 Acadians. There's over 60,000 um, Canadian. So this would be not only potentially as barbaric um, as the last time, but even bigger and probably messier uh, because of that. So logistically, this is, just doesn't make sense. Uh, you, don't want, you don't want the bad stain of engaging in this kind of barbaric practice, um, and it's also just a kind of big, cumbersome thing to do, so you probably don't want to do it. So what do you do? What are you going to do at that point? 1774, nine years, takes nine years to do this, but 1774, they passed the Quebec Act. Now note that timing, that's just before the American Revolution begins, and that will, will, you'll see that significance in a few minutes. But here they are trying to deal with the French Canadian population. So what do they do? Largely, they try to accommodate the new constitutional framework of this now British colony to established French ways. Uh, you might think that's weird, but it also, of course, makes perfect sense. You want to buy some peace. You want to buy uh, a sense that you will rule fairly for these people. So you don't want to be coming in and imposing your will, imposing your own rules. Um, this is a functioning society with functioning law. Why not allow it to continue? And if you think about it, it's also just common sense. Civil law is part of almost every facet of life. Marriage contracts, business contracts, property deeds. Most of the world is governed through civil law. To convert all that stuff to, to, to British common law, you know, that, that would have been a, a disaster. Um, everybody would have hated this. The British would have hated this. The French, the only people that would have loved this would be lawyers. Lawyers would make a lot of money out of this, but, but not, 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 not ordinary people. They would hate this. This would be a mess. They also allow Catholics to hold office. Now, this is really unusual. In Great Britain, in 1774, Catholics can't hold office. So again, they're saying to the French Canadians, or at least to the elite, because remember, it's an assembly, not a, oops, I haven't got there yet. I'll be, you'll see that in a second. These are appointed offices. Um, so they'd be largely elite figures, but it's also still saying to you, saying to those elites, we'll allow you to participate in the government of your society. And they do it. They appoint lots of French Canadians uh, to, these, to these offices. It sanctions the collection of tithes Again, in Britain, this was not legal. But again, it's acknowledging that the only way the Catholic faith can continue is if the Catholic Church continues. The only way the Catholic Church can continue is if it has some money. It needs to keep up its institutions. It needs to be able to build churches and hire priests and pay bishops and do all the things and run schools and do all the things that the Catholic Church does. So that's really, really important. So allowing them to collect tithes, the, 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 the church taxes, uh, to get some money. They established the Legislative Council, a point that I sneaked out earlier. Um, an important distinction, we'll see this a lot in the next few weeks, it's a council, not an assembly. A council, uh, a council is an appointed body, an assembly is an elected body. So it's not a democratic council, um, but it does have French Catholic representation on it. And, and again, that's meant to, be, meant to be part of allowing people to govern their own society. Finally, and this is where well, actually, parts of that creep into the American Revolution as well. But this is where it really creeps into the American Revolution. It restores the old boundaries of Quebec. So recall that map from 1763. You can go back in the video if you want to take a peek at that. But recall that map from 1763. Quebec looked pretty small, basically what's modern southern Quebec today. But it didn't go down into the Ohio River Valley like it did in the French period. So it restored the old French boundaries. And in part, this is, again, part of that larger accommodation. But again, in part, it's also telling the New England colonies, we control that territory, meaning Britain, we control that territory, not you colonists. 
uh, and again, trying to check their ambitions to moving into that territory. This means that the Quebec Act is highly unpopular. Uh, part of it stems from the religious reasons, part of it stems from the fact that, they, uh, that, the, that people object to the religious basis of giving Catholics power. This is certainly what, what, how it's viewed in England. This is a cartoon from 1774 mocking the political politicians that made this decision. Here we see Catholic bishops artfully dancing around the Quebec Bill, and you can see the, there's musicians over on the side, uh, but, they're be, but they're being directed by the devil. They're, you know, they're dancing here, but they're dancing to the devil's music. Uh, so this is a concession to, to Catholics, and good Protestants shouldn't be conceding to Catholics in, in, in this cartoon's view. In America, too, it's viewed as an, as an insult, and in part it's that religious basis, but it's also, again, that land basis, that political basis of saying that land is, is not colonist land, it's British land, we will control its fate. Um, and again, this becomes part of the campaign in the United States, um, uh, this, this sense of widespread um, grievance that the, that the British government is imposing its will on these colonists against their own ability to govern themselves, taking power away from uh, the colonists. So the Quebec Act feeds into that, and it comes to be known as one of, one of the intolerable acts. And the intolerable acts are that series of British legislations that are passed in the 1760s and 1770s uh, that, uh, that lead to the American Revolution. Finally, I'm going to talk for one minute about a kind of longer-term legacy of all of this. I mentioned in the, uh, in the Benjamin West painting that many English Canadians view this as kind of a foundation, a kind of moment where British Canada is born. And that's true. Um, all kinds of ways you need to qualify that, but it's true. In the late 19th century, after Canada becomes a country, like after this course is over, um, lots of new national symbols come to be. And one of these is, is our first national anthem. It's not an official national anthem, it's an unofficial national anthem, but it's certainly regarded as the national anthem in English Canada. And the lyrics are really interesting and they pertain directly to the Seven Years' War. Now listen, to, this is the opening, opening verse. In days of yore from Britain's shore, Wolf, the, you know, the, the Plains of Abraham hero, Wolf, the dauntless hero, came and planted Britannia's flag on Canada's fair domain. So a British story of conquest, Wolf, the hero, conquering this territory. Here may it wave, that flag, here may that flag wave, our boast, our pride, and join together, join together, the thistle, Scotland, the shamrock, Ireland, the rose, entwined, joining them together, entwined together. And of course, what's missing there? Well, there's another flower you could easily mention there. You could say the fleur-de-lis. Where is the fleur-de-lis? Uh, at this point in time in Canadian history, French Canadians represent about a third of the population, and yet they get erased entirely in the unofficial national anthem of the day. The maple leaf forever, the Canadian symbol, is made up of these flowers, the thistle, the shamrock, the rose, not the fleur-de-lis. So there's that kind of lingering sense there that that this is a moment when, not when something was born in the sense that, you know, something new was created, British Canada, but also a moment where something was crushed, where French Canada uh, had its will stomped upon by these British heroes. And it means that Confederation, in this view, is more of uh, uh, English Canada, Canadians exercise a kind of mastery or, or mastery over uh, French Canadians rather than a partnership with French Canadians. So I would, I would suggest to you that maybe that, that, the, that the Seven Years' War um, is, is, it continues to have a legacy here in the late 19th century, but also in many ways today with things like the Royal Proclamation.